Well, thank you all for being here on this wonderful day. I heard that many of you had wanted this to be relocated outside in light of the wonderful weather, but sadly, there will be too many beautiful views distracting us, and I think what we have to talk about here is not just important, but really urgent, which brings us to the theme, which is the next decade matters, and if we don't act now, we are going to be paying a huge colossal price, and it will become clear throughout the next two or three hours, both why there are amazing opportunities to act and the huge, tremendous cost of inaction if we fail to take this task urgently and importantly. What exactly the task is, what each of us can do in our various roles will become clear, I hope, throughout the day. And we should all go back if things work out energized and ready to take action, not just in the next decade, not just in the next year, but already in the next week. With that, may I please invite Vice Rector to come and say a few words. So it's new to me, this is my first time in Innsbruck, but Innsbruck is a hotbed of sustainability, and I would really, really love for our audience to hear uh, for a couple of minutes how this came about and what the plan is going forward. Thank you, and first of all, welcome to our university. In behalf of the rector, I want to say a warm welcome. Um, in the, our really oldest uh, event uh, restoration here, and I hope you enjoy not even inside, but also outside, because it's really a wonderful day to outside. But hopefully this will be also in the future, and um, sustainability is a rain mark here at our university. Not only because of the innovation lab, we founded in 2060 a lab of um, sustainability, which was supported from the Sun Stiftung. And in this special platform, there are three professors um, belonging, Kerstin Neumann belonging to the Institute of uh, Strategic, Strategic Marketing and Tourism, management and tourism, and two other professors, Martin Stuchtai and um, Mr. Chionia, um, belonging to the Institute of Geography. And the Innovation Lab stands for a platform in order to um, collect all the deals, uh, looking from different parts or the different views from um, scientific aspects to the big topic of sustainability, and I think nearly all of our researcher is dealing with the topic, but all from different aspects, and one part of the, one goal of the innovation lab we founded in, yeah, two years ago is to collect all the different topics and have um, the combination of the different aspects of sustainability, not only the economical part, the ecological and the social part as well, and I think this is one of the big um, advantages of a, such a wide university we have here with uh, nearly all of the subje subjects, not only in teaching as well as also in research. And we are very happy to have this special sustainability lab, but even also a lot of other researchers doing research on sustainability. But um, I hope now to bring all to the other researchers the aspects and the advantages of the sustainability lab we got there. Thank you so much, Professor Dr. Bokivas. Uh, Martin, uh, you had a fantastic book that I loved, enjoyed, and really enjoyed reading. In that, you make an interesting proposition that uh, we are sort of living in an age where both the potential damage that we are doing to the ecology uh, is huge, but also technological progress has meant that there has never been a time where we actually hold all the solutions to. So it's almost as if with one hand we have the potential to inflict, and we are inflicting tremendous damage, but we also hold all the answers in our hands. And given that you span the world of business and academia, how should we be going about that? Well, first of all, I can't start talking without thanking the university and we're thanking all of you for um, 
affording uh, a Friday afternoon for the discussion uh, that the next uh, decade uh, matters. Uh, the book was uh, a thought experiment. It was uh, the attempt to bring together uh, the experience that uh, we uh, have in the Innovation Lab, that we have at Systemic, and that we've had, Jeremy and I, in our old world um, in consulting, where sort of we were increasingly working at the interface between economic systems and natural systems. And uh, uh, you can't do that without finding out that sort of the, the, uh, the price of our economic activities uh, for natural systems is increasingly getting prohibitive. But you're also finding out that um, the natural systems could in fact get in the way of all the promises that we have made towards further growth. So there is something to be um, uh, resolved here. And that is happening at a moment where uh, of massive acceleration. I mean, there's, uh, uh, if you, uh, there will be two billion uh, middle class consumers joining us over the next 10 years. There will be, uh, we will be um, uh, creating 200 more cities of a million uh, over the next years. We will, um, uh, uh, we will deploy sort of 25% more of cars onto our roads in the next uh, in the next 10 years. So there is a massive acceleration, um, but at the same time, sort of it's also a moment sort of where we, for the first time, and that wasn't true uh, five or 10 years ago. I think we have uh, te technological solutions in our in our back pocket. Uh, uh, the the Internet of Things is an interesting one. Probably we have 200 connected devices in this room today. In 10 years' time, it's going to be 20,000 in this room. Um, that essentially allows us to completely differently link information and materials in a way that we can walk away from a world where things are um, useless after one use cycle. Uh, the same thing goes for PV. Over the last 10 years, we have seen photovoltaic costs coming down all the way down to five or six dollars per mega megawatt hours. We have uh, uh, seen um, the, the iPhone itself. So that we will have in five years time, we will have more than um, 10 billion um, subscriptions worldwide, and every one of them allows us uh, to deal completely differently with mobility, with energy, with uh, industrial process. So I think there is, an, uh, there is a wonderful coincidence. And the one way to tell the story positively and uh, um, differently from the way we've done it when we talked about sustainability in the past, that this is in fact a unique opportunity, the coincidence uh, of a major societal challenge, which by the way, since 2015, both in New York, the Sustainable Development Goals, and then in, on the 12th of December in Paris, we globally acknowledged we have, um, that this is uh, temporarily coinciding with uh, a completely new technological exponential capability. And that's the one way to really uh, find uh, hope and to turn a debate that was a downer uh, into an upper, and I think that's what we have to, um, that, that's what we have to go for. Uh, it reminds me of uh, an NRA quote, guns don't kill people, people kill people. Technology doesn't do harm, technology uh, does good or harm depending on how it's used. And so it really does matter how it's deployed, but we have all the tools. I mean, we, we have many discussions on digitization, and um, you, you could see this uh, uh, in the German grand, co uh, grand coalition negotiations. You can see it all over the political spectrum, how much time we spend on the question of digitization. Um, there is a, 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 a very expansive uh, discussion around Industry 4.0. Um, we, could we could decide that we wanted to spend the same time on what is it that um, this technology actually should do for society, and we don't discuss that enough. We we can use technology to dehumanize society. We can use technology to rehumanize it. We can use technology, and that's sort of the uh, the point that we are trying to make in the book. You can actually try to uh, to uh, build an economic system that's entirely decoupled from um, the excessive use of natural resources. That's an interesting sort of way to bring technology to use. Uh, Dr. Klaus Lindwinkel, uh, you need no introduction, but. Uh, after you stepped down from Deutsche Post, you took over the foundation, and you have done some terrific work there on sustainability, and you also set up the Sun Institute for Environment and Sustainability. Um, would you want to uh, comment on the, on the issue of the day about the next decade mattering? And would you, would you want to speak from the podium or where you are, whatever you are happier with? <laughs> you look very comfortable. <laughs> I'm a little prepared for a speech, so 
let me talk about the uh, relationship between research, because we are on a research ground, but policy advice and good decisions to improve our life. Okay? And that is the intellectual space where Martin, the Innovation Lab for Sustainability of this university, and myself are partners. I'm the less important partner, I'm just funding it. So the work is done by the other one. <coughs> so what is my thinking in that uh, respect? I am convinced of one special way to help. That is, better research in economics is a precondition for evidence-based policy advice. And this advice leads to better decisions and actions and finally leads to improve our lives. So let me give <coughs> you one or two examples. When I established the Deutsche Post Stiftung 20 years ago, we started with a research institute called IZA, Institute of Labor Economics. And the mission is, was and still is, conducting research in labor economics and providing evidence-based policy advice on labor market issues. And in Germany, as probably some or many of you know, about 15 years ago, there was a big labor market reform because we had a big, we had a big labor market crisis with nearly 7 million unemployed, and it's called Hartz IV. And today, it is one of the main pillars of the German economic success. We were able to help, I mean, this little institute were able to help the German government and Chancellor Schröder with our expertise. And my experience was, as a businessman, I was used to, let's say, thousands of pages of due diligence documents before any big acquisition. Therefore, it was shocking to see politicians deciding on no solid base, decisions that profoundly affected the lives of millions of people and cost billions of euros were made without any rules in labor market research, without any good analytical thinking and often with no fact base at all. Now this has changed quite a bit. Today, this law, under our influence, mandates, for example, an ev evaluation of the actions taken. And politicians hate that because <laughs> the result could be that it was a bad law or a bad character. Yeah, a bad action. So it is, the evaluation is verify and falsify, as Sir Karl Popper would put it. So the second institute I established is the BRIC Institute on Behavioral Economics and in Inequality. There the research also focuses uh, on this, and we believe that scientific research is a precondition for evidence-based policy advice and the evaluation of economic and social policies. So now the sum, <coughs> the Innovation Lab for Sustainability in Innsbruck is supported by our youngest daughter, the Sun Institute, Environment and Sustainability, which supports economic research and evidence-based policy advice in this area. And I think uh, the Vice Rector discussed already the objectives of the Innovation Lab here. And this lab, established in 2016, has three endowed professorships, and Martin holds one of them. The, the lab had a great start and even greater and bigger ambitious plan for the future. So what is my take on it? What is my experience at this interface of research, policy advice, and then finally real action. Let me quote Popper again with two of his insights on the logic of scientific discovery. Number one, theories are not verifiable, but they can be corroborated. Second, deliberate experimentation is dominated by theory. And sometimes I feel as a manager that we experiment a lot also in the management team, but we always need a theory in order to verify our forecast. 
So based on my understanding of economics, let me put it this way. The foundations of good decision making are scientific findings that live up to scrutiny. They will then lead to fact-based decisions and actions to create a better world. So after several decades of experience in the business, political, and a little bit in the scientific world, let me offer a friendly advice to all of you, the young people at Systemic and some students and the young at heart. Good thinking with high quality is the basis of everything. And the good news is thinking can be a lot of fun. Thank you. May, may I ask you to, in a minute or so, repeat the story of Deutsche Post and electric vehicles that you just told me before? Because that combines evidence, the scale, and innovation of business and policy making all rolled into one. And it's a fantastic story. So, at Deutsche Post DHL, there are around 1,000 planes flying this day around the planet, and there are 150,000 cars driving in 200 countries. So, and my passion was always in this green field. And around seven years ago, uh, I tried to convince the CEOs of the Volkswagens or Mercedes, you know, buy an electric car for a fleet owner like the Deutsche Post. We had, I think, Thomas, 100,000 cars in, in Germany. And it's very easy. You know exactly they start from the depot, they drive 120 kilometers, they come back. So it's very easy to produce an electric vehicles because you have professional drivers. So, and they said, well, it's such a small niche and so mingle, we, we want to sell you my, my own car, the golf cars, etc." <coughs> and I couldn't convince them. So I said, okay, we go to German, the, the engineering school of Aachen, the, I think the best one in Germany. We found three professors and they built a little model, then a bigger model, and then a real model, and then we built a small factory, then a bigger factory, so it was just a venture like what you are trying to do at Systemic. And after now, I would say 12 years, I mean, we have 5,000 cars deli delivering parcels on the street in Germany. They're yellow and a little bit green. Everybody loves it. They're a little bit ugly, but they are wonderful <laughs> electrical cars, beautiful. So already 8% or so of, what on the of the fleet in, in Germany are electrical cars. And now the other fleet owners come to us and say, can we buy cars from you? And now we are building a second factory and we are going to sell electrical cars. Wonderful, okay. what a story. Uh, and uh, thank so you we are thank ahead of the big guys. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Uh, so Martin, you have uh, six children. You're an alpine farmer, an avid mountaineer and skier. You used to run the McKinsey office in Munich and you have co-founded Systemic, and yet you are only 50. What is your secret? <laughs> My wife. <laughs> so if you're wondering, this was not pre-rehearsed. You know, the brownie points are genuine. <laughs> uh, Uncle, thank you so much for hosting us again. And one quick last question. What are you hoping to get out of today? Good ideas for the next 10 years. Wonderful. Thank you so much, everybody.